Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast, episode number 74, with Horatio Sanchez, the president and CEO of Resiliency Inc., an agency leader in helping schools improve school climate, instruction, and discipline with tools and resources that include his most recent book, The Education Revolution. My name is Andrea Samadhi. I'm a former educator who created this podcast to bring the most current neuroscience research along with high-performing experts with specific strategies or ideas that you can implement immediately to take your results to the next level. Welcome Horatio, it's such an honor to have you here today, especially knowing that one of our earliest episodes, it was actually episode three with Ron Hall from Valley Day School, on launching your neuroeducational program features you in the YouTube video. And if anyone wants to go back and look, I highly recommend just going back and listening to Ron Hall's experience of how he discovered neuroeducation, where he says that within 10 minutes of Horatio's presentation, he saw his whole future in education change in front of his eyes. Welcome, Horatio. Uh, Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Thanks so much. I want to just give a little bit more about your background because it is so vast in the field of neuroeducation, just so people can see where you've come from and where you're going with this. Horatio Sanchez is recognized as one of the nation's prominent experts on promoting students' resiliency and applying brain science to improve school outcomes. Horatio has been a leader, teacher, administrator, clinician, mental health director and consultant to the Department of Ed in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and other states. His diverse education and background have helped him to merge research, science, and practice, which is why he's been so successful in this field of neuroeducation. His best-selling book, The Education Revolution, published by Corwin Press, addresses the decline in empathy, increase in obesity that we're seeing with our youngsters today, and the impact of implicit bias on minority students. Welcome, Horatio. I have so many questions for you, and I hope we can get them all in. Hey, let's try. All right. Well, I love how you named your company Resiliency, Inc., as the word resiliency is so important these days, especially in education as well as our home lives. Can you tell the story that I heard you tell on a podcast talking about how resiliency is built in a person? And I just loved how you talked about it. Can you explain how we build resilience? First, we probably should explain what resiliency is. Um, I find it's pretty misunderstood. Resiliency is a collection of protective factors that offset the risk that you have in your life. So it's kind of like not equal for everybody because if you have very little risk, it takes a little less to be resilient. But if you have a lot of risk, it takes a lot more protectives to offset the scale. You seem to begin to be at risk at three risk factors and every risk factor after that, it gets really more severe. In North Carolina, we had a class action lawsuit group called Willie M and they were the upper two percentile of severity. They averaged 13 0.5 0.5 risk factors. Wow. It was like, which ones did they have? And, and the resiliency is the ability to gain that so you could have good outcomes in your life. So you can't be resilient without having good outcomes. It means that you have overcome and you have good outcomes in your life. Now, um, up to the work that we began long ago when I was director of mental health in Wake County, All we knew was that people were, some people were naturally resilient. So if you look at the world and the people who are at high risk, 25% of that population that qualifies as high risk seem to be naturally resilient. So they get, they overcome the risk in their lives. What we tried to do was to see if we could instill resiliency in people who were not naturally resilient because they were in mental health they were receiving services, they had complex issues, and we took the most severe class and tried to promote protective factors. Now, in all honesty, um, if you have 13.5 risk factors, you gaining a couple protective factors is not gonna make a difference. It's gonna take a little while to take hold. 
by the way, I did not know this. <laughs> and so uh, on the route to the kids recovering and our approach being tested, we had a lot of stuff happen. We had a car blew up in the parking lot set by one of the kids that we got out of the hospital. We had a house set on fire. We had lots of crisis. And what we did was we tried to normalize it as best as possible. We took kids that didn't have homes and we put them in single family homes, not programmed, but the families were trained. And we told them build relationships and promote protective factors that are usually found in families. We assigned every kid with a mentor and we told them build relationships and promote any protective factor on the list that are proven protective factors. And then we had a crisis team and the fo focus of the crisis team was that if something happened, sweep in there, see what we could do to protect the relationships and then get it back going again. And um, even when we hospitalized, we only hospitalized for 24 hours, we used the dip motion. So they were only in the hospital 24 hours and mediated right back. And then we started to work on it. A few lessons we learned is um, we kind of suck at relationships. <laughs> and so um, we had to try to teach people some of the elements of relationship, how to build it. And you think that's unusual, but I guess it shouldn't be shocking to us if you look at our marriage and divorce rates. We also have people who really don't maintain relationships well. There are lots of people who stop talking to family members because of one incident. So it wasn't surprising, but we had to learn that. And we also had to learn how to build protective factors. And something happened with one of our young ladies around year two. And she was the one who the relationships had taken hold for a while and she had gained enough protective factors. And lo and behold, suddenly we were seeing better outcomes at home, in the community. And suddenly that group, that initial group started reaping the rewards. And it got such that um, the state took the model and tried to do it with all the kids of our percentile. And the data was fairly consistent. If kids, maintain relationships and gain enough protective factors, regardless of their presenting issues, they got better. Now, granted, what is better? Better in this case is they overcame some horrible things and it didn't erase the past, but made them be able to cope with the past to have success in life. So quality of life was improved. And that is the reason that I think resiliency is remarkable because it's, it doesn't care about your gender, it doesn't care about your culture, it doesn't care about your race, it doesn't care about your mental health issues, it doesn't care about your background. Anyone, if you build protective factors and maintain relationships in your life, becomes more resilient. Can you name a couple of the protective factors? Like I, I clearly get the relationships to help through, the, but what were maybe two or three protective factors? Um, protective factors are kind of funny. Some you're born with, uh, or just like risk factors, some you're born with. So a protective factor that you're born with is you could be the first born. You can't undo it. Um, if you have easy temperament, it's a protective fact. Those are, those are some of those, you have them because of those kind of things. There's protective factors that fall into the adolescence life, like um, um, hope and expectation for the future. Um, future planning, that means actually planning for your future. Um, gaining any competency. There are protective factors in the home, like um, knowing the whereabouts of your child, discipline with discussion, not punitive. Um, if you have uh, at least one parent that you perceive cares about you. There's actually some protective factors that are perceptual. Um, if you think one of your parents loves you, um, it seems to be, regardless what anybody else thinks, it bestows that protective on you. And then there's some protectives that are kind of pretty cool and different because um, having faith is actually a protective factor. Um, belonging to a community of faith is a protective factor. Um, so some beliefs, having that stability seems to be protective factors. So there are some that you're born with, some you acquire, 
and some you acquire you can never lose and some you acquire and can lose well that's powerful to think about this and and how you're building this with students i never thought about resiliency this deep so thanks for for that answer now as i've been going into schools i'm a former publishing rep so i've actually visited i'd say more than 100 and you walk into a school you can feel that climate when you open the door and you walk right. in and sometimes in the parking lot and we all know that feeling and we know our students feel it but how do you improve school climate and what outcomes does the school typically see with your school climate improvement plan well actually we look at it we approach it almost as a neuroscience approach and we do we concentrate on three basic areas one is homeostasis and homeostasis is that range of chemical balance in which we perform optimally well um, one of the things that requires for our homeostasis is predictability of our environment safe and predictable environments and if you start to think about schools one of the trends that we see happening nationally is that schools are being built bigger. So now you have kids who are walking in and they're instead of having to deal with 200 kids, you're asking them to deal with 2,000 kids or 1,000 kids. Now, think about your brain and how your brain processes and all what stimuli does to the human brain. Well, think about a school with 1,000 kids. The bell rings, bling, 1,000 kids rush into the hallway and they walk quietly in single file. No, they don't. They, they do what kids do and they move around and they do all the stuff. For the kids who tend to have less chemical balance, the kids who have more emotional disorders, for the kids who are under more degrees of stress, that transition by itself can be so stimulating that it increases impulsivity or sometimes very adverse behavior. So we actually try to take schools to, first of all, ritualize that process by thinking about teaching what you want the students to do and making it as predictable as possible because if less things happen, those kind of places are better. So we start thinking about coming into school, transitions, lunch. Those are places where stimuli explodes. Mm -hmm. That's step one, because everything happens in the school climate. Safe, predictable climate is key. The second thing we look at is what is called social comfort. Um, once again, you're putting all of these kids, sometimes you have diverse social economics, culture, races, all in one school, and you're dropping them in and saying, get along. <laughs> and um, it doesn't necessarily work well for all kids. Yes, there, there are kids who can get along with everybody, but we are more designed to get along with people who are similar to us. And the diversity and the range can sometimes be overwhelming. We know some things about our amygdala, our emotional brain, and one of the things we know about the emotional brain is the moment we find that we have something in common with someone else, it relaxes the amygdala. Think about yourself. If you're, if you're traveling, if I'm traveling and I have a Yankee t-shirt on and the guy sits down next to me on the plane and he's a Yankee fan, you know exactly what's going to happen. Oh, I love the Yankees too. And immediately connection. Um, I, you find it all the time. You talk to someone, you have something in common, connection. Um, so we have the kids and the teachers do something right at the beginning of the year, a survey in which the students start to find out what they have in common. But that's not the only thing we do. We have them do activities that they can only accomplish by cooperating with each other. So we look at the, the, um, the list of commonalities and the teacher makes groupings and the students are grouped based on things they have in common, not that because of natural selection. And that group then has to perform an act that they can only do cooperating. Why do we do it that way? Why is it a physical action? It's embodied cognition. Embodied cognition tells us that we can teach a concept very quickly through a physical activity or through an action because our brains anchor abstract concepts to concrete things. So in the first three weeks of school, the teachers have manipulated that list in a way that every child has cooperated with other students that they wouldn't have other worked with 
based on being grouped because they have something in common. And now when those kids walk into the classroom, regardless of them having a natural attraction to the kids who are most like them, they feel a sense of comfort across the classroom because they know they all share something in common and they all can cooperate and get along with each other. And the last thing we do is we make sure that the students believe that they can be successful at school. And um, one of the three values of the amygdala, safety, the need to be loved, and the need for success. Well, success is the thing that motivates us. Um, when we succeed, dopamine secretes, motivating us to do it again. Well, a lot of kids struggle at school, and one of the things we want them to do is have the generalized skill sets that make them do better at all academic endeavors. So for example, one of the things we have them do is a skill building activity or, or a skill building thing that's concrete that'll make them more successful at school is to improve their focus. And we picked focus because due to multitasking with technology, most students are struggling with focus. But you and I both know, if you can improve your ability to focus, you learn better, you retain better, you perform better. So the teachers go through drills and they improve the students' focus periodically throughout the school year. And as the students' focus improves, so does their performance. Those are concrete skills. And we have a few of them that if we can get the students to build, they think, well, I can now do better at school. And those kind of the things we do to really try to improve school climate and overall student performance. Well, I love that you talked about finding a connection with the teacher and the student. Because I know that being in sales, so coming from a background of going into schools to go to the, the administrator's office, we were taught, you know, find something that you are, you connect to with that person. And I would go far wrong if I was to mention a sports team. I, I would get the, the sport wrong. But I could find a book and connect to a book on the administrator shelf and talk and know what books they're studying. But I never ever thought about teachers doing that with students. How, how powerful that could be that the student now has something in common. Oh, we go to the same church or we, you know, I think of all the schools that are most successful. They have that connection with that teacher. And I never thought about it that way. And we try to make sure, and we try to tell them it has to happen in the first couple of weeks of school, because if you don't do in the first couple of weeks of school, the amygdala is attracted to itself and the kids will get into their own little pods. And you notice those, and that's just natural attraction. You're attracted to who you're attracted to. But the one thing people are not aware of is that when you get into your little groupings, when stress enters the environment, the amygdala is prone to become agitated to those who are least like us. So if you have any stress in your environment, oftentimes if you don't have a level of comfort, you will see cliques agit become agitated towards other cliques who are least like them. And you see it not only with students, you see it with teacher groupings. Mm -hmm. So if you get that le level of comfort up front, you can avoid that separation that happens that often leads to a lot of other incidents like things like bullying. Wow, that's a very powerful concept to think about. Now, Horatio, one of the motivators for me doing this work with social emotional learning and neuroscience, it actually began in the late 90s and Columbine, that tragedy was a huge motivator for me personally to take action. Mm -hmm. With all of your knowledge with students with emotional disorders, why do you think that we have these incidents in the US? The human brain adapts to anything. I mean, people, people can adopt, adapt to some of the most terrible things in their life and the brain will tend not to have the same level of secretion after seeing it over and over again. I, one of the sad things about being in a violent um, country, and that's what we have, a violent country, is that we become numb to the violence and it becomes, you've heard it all before. Here's the incident, here's the, initial response, then we tie right back down because it's happened and it will happen again. So I think we're to the place where we have become a violent nation that actually has learned to ignore it. And by the way, if you look at violent countries, that's exactly what people will tell you. They have become numb to the violence. 
Um, if you look at the countries that are, have, are really low in violence, if something happens, it seems like everything stops and the country goes into mourning and people are devastated. That's because it's an anomaly. Here, it's, we're so bad, we try to tell people one of the ways to overcome violence is to be prepared for violence. Really? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's absurd. And the other thing I think we need to think about is schools, and we t I tell administrators all the time, is that if you look at the profile of school shooters, it is not a difficult temperament kid who's aggressive and violent, who's out there getting all of your attention. It is usually the shy and anxious kid who's been the primary profile of a school shooter. Here's the problem. Administrators, teachers, students, all focus on the popular kids or the aggressive kids and the kids that get all our attention. Oddity or being an outcast or being on the peripheral, oftentimes in schools get you completely ignored or victimized. And the fact that we tend not to be attracted to oddity, we don't tend to be compassionate towards it, means that those students can go through a fairly nondescript to a very abusive life at school. And we have studied and found out many times it is not even seen by folks because we tend to block out things or people who are less like us. And as a result, we ignore them. One of the things we try to tell them is all those outcasts, all the people who are on the peripheral, all the people who are targets for bullying, we need to create an environment where one, they feel a little bit more comfortable, two, that people are looking out for them and have compassion for them. And if you set up that environment, these incidents will be less likely to occur. If you think about all those little dossiers left over from people who committed it, was oftentimes of saying, this happened to me for so long and no one said or saw anything. Well, we were there, but we didn't see. And I think when we become more sensitive and become on the lookout for it, we do a lot better job. That's so true. It's so true. And I think about even when I was in high school, we naturally did this. We didn't separate people. We, we did have cliques, but we all got along. And I just go into schools these days and I just wish it was like how I experienced school, but it's not that way anymore. Like things change. Do you think it's technology that's made us all not aware of other people's feelings and emotions? What, why are we here? Um, okay. We, we have a perfect storm that happened. And I think um, we have had a drop in empathy and we become a more callous nation. We become more callous and, and children and adolescents seem more callous than ever. And that will have to do with um, a, a, a perfect storm of multiple things happening at the same time that produced it. Now, empathy, we are born with a capacity for empathy, but we're not born with empathy fully developed. Um, so, for example, empathy occurs when someone is, sees a person express an emotion, nonverbal or by tonality, that mirror neurons repeat in our brains, that activate motor neurons, so that we're almost experiencing what the other person is experiencing chemically, and that gives us a sense of compassion. People are actually more empathetic. They actually mirror not only in their brain, but externally what they're seeing, which gives them an even stronger chemical experience. So when we smile or frown, we're having a chemical experience. If our brains does it inside our brains because we see someone else do it, we share in the experience to a milder form. So one of the things we, we are naturally designed to do is to look at like facial expressions. But it's not fully developed. At age one, we've noticed now through fMRIs that babies recognize emotional shifts in caretaker. Mm -hmm. But it's not really high skilled. It seems to take a big leap in advancement around age 10 to 13. Right around the end of 13, kids are starting to get better at responding to the nonverbal um, emotional cue. 
because that's the nature of empathy. You're supposed to be responding, not just feeling responding. I mean, if you see someone distressed, shouldn't you say, can I help you or are you okay? Mm -hmm. um, we hit a peak in our 20s from 23 onwards. Um, then we take a little bit of a dive in our 50s. We tend not to have as strong emotions to the chemistry. And then in our 60s, for some parts of the population, the ability to read drops. And that's why elderly people are victims of scams because they can't read the nonverbal intentions of people as well. So all of this is a, a, a whole growth pattern in, in how we read people and empathy. Well, think about it. For us to be empathetic, we have to, one, observe, and two, process and understand it. Well, how do we get there? We get there by seeing people and engaging in people. Well, perfect storm. One, the speed of our lives. We are going so fast that we have very little time for things of noticing. Second thing that started to happen was we started to have a situation in which everything in our life is designed for instant, instant gratification. Well, instant gratification reduces that ability to wait, and that reducing that makes us more self-centered. And then three, we had the issue of communication becoming from face-to-face -face or by phone becoming texting being the number one form of communication. Now, texting has made our brains lazy. We no longer have to process anything and it makes it easy and we're finding kids are just avoiding it. Um, think about it this way. There are times when you may not want to deal with your mom. Do you call her or do you text her? Texting is easy. You don't have to process her voice tone. You don't have to do anything. Just hearing her voice will alter your emotions and your brain is working. If we're talking face to face, guess what? My brain is working and your brain is working. Well, if we raising a generations of kids who are now avoiding actually doing that work, they one, don't develop it and two, tend to avoid it more. Well, if you're not building empathy, you're definitely losing empathy, and we have ends up being more of a callous situation. That's why you're seeing kids who are not even high-risk kids engage in pretty nasty behavior because we are less empathetic. And empathetic empathy dropping is not just, oh, this is what they're saying. That's been studied. We've had a, a direct pattern of drop in empathy for the last 30 years now, and it's becoming more severe as we become less able to engage. So one of the things we try to tell kids is we're not trying to put technology away. That's, that's crazy. What we're trying to tell you is that you better spend enough time talking to people face to face or at least calling them and, and stop thinking about avoiding the hard work. I mean, yeah, you know, you don't want to talk to mom when there's a big issue because it's going to be work. And that's what people are starting to think about just daily encounter. Everything is just too much work. So texting is easy. And you see kids sitting next, next to each other texting and you think it's a joke. Well, it's not a joke because I've seen it in real life. I'm in a room with teenagers and they're texting and not even looking at each other. And then they'll crack a joke. They'll smile at the phone and not take the time to look. You can't build empathy unless you're looking and engaging. And I think that's a problem. And we need to just have enough looking and engaging. Because one of the things I see in schools is that we're missing the needs of students because our teachers are less empathetic. They're, they're, they don't see it. The peers aren't seeing it. And as a result, that is, issue talked about recently about the person who is more likely to become a school shooter. Well, one of the reasons is they don't even notice the pain, person's pain. That's right in front of them looking downtrodden, overwhelmed, and has been that way for two years. But we all notice it in retrospect. We go like, oh my God, I, we should have noticed that he's always been, he's always been withdrawn. It's kind of late then. I think um, improving the skill sets and we actually teach it because if, if we teach students about what's happening in their brains and we teach them how these things occur, 
and how we can improve it. Schools can have programs. You know that if you do acts of kindness, you can improve empathy response. If you, so have them do some of those community programs, have them go serve, um, have them um, do meals, have them do for the community, have them do for other people. And those kinds of actions can bring them out of themselves and increase their empathy response. Love it. Love it. And it just made me think when you were talking, because we read so much uh, with our facial cues, with our tones of voice. And then what's going to happen when we're in schools now with masks, you know, we're covered up, like what's going to happen to that? Now it's going to change and be different. We're not going to see and feel not as really. much. I don't, I don't oh, think, think so. Um, yeah. If If you, if you think about true empathy, empathy is face, hands, body, posture, tonality. All of them produce empathy. So, um, and believe me, we can tell a lot if you're smiling. Your, your face could be covered. I could still tell you if you're smiling. Sure. But you'll still have your hands. You'll still have your body posture. You'll still have your tone of voice. If we've been, if we have been becoming empathetic people, it won't make a difference. You will notice it, it'll read just fine. If you haven't been empathetic well to this point, it will make it tougher. Got it, got it. That's lots to think about. And especially these days, Horatio, and it's so clear that students are not learning as much as they could or should be learning because of the fact they've been doing distance learning schools were out when they should have been in it just is what it is and parents are just not equipped to be teachers and i'm really talking from the heart because i have a teaching degree and i still did not do a great job with with my girls at home trying to do work balance work and homeschooling it just uh, could have been better so now i'm thinking that there's kids out there that don't have the tools. Like I've got all the tools here, I've got a teaching degree, I've got online stuff that they can do in all the subject areas, but there's kids that don't have this. And so I'm thinking about with a sense of urgency, the students of poverty who might be struggling these days with less instruction, not just what, what I saw with my kids. So especially if parents are working and not focused on their children. How does culture and poverty impact an individual's perceptions, behaviors, and how they learn? And what solutions can you think about these days for us to help that, that group? Um, culture impacts how your brain processes. So let me give you a couple examples. Let's say um, if you are in an individualist culture, which is United States is considered an individualist culture. Now, let's say if you were raised in Japan, that is not an individualist culture, um, your brain will process differently. So even, even in how you perceive yourself, they put, put the um, folks under fMRI, and if you come from an individualist culture and you think about yourself, we know what parts of your brain lights up. Um, when a person who comes from a collectivist culture thinks about themselves, it is the part of the brain that when you're thinking about another person that lights up. So even just self-reflection is different. But even how you approach problems or, or how you see things is different. If you put a picture in front of someone from a collectivist culture, they look at the picture as a whole, while someone from an individualist culture focuses on the center thing in the picture. Um, that also seems to work towards processing because if you have them do a problem where there's a central issue, a person from an individualist culture usually takes that, does that better, while a person from a collectivist culture, if you're trying to find a problem in a system, they seem to attack that better because their brain is just more used to it. So one of the things we know about culture is that it does alter how you process is not better or worse, it's just how you process. Um, there's a research lab in Berlin, and it's probably one of the top performing labs in the world. Um, it has gone out of its way to get researchers from every country gathered to one place, and they continuously publish more, get written in best papers, get the most grants, 
And one of the researchers wrote about their experience and basically he said this, early in the process, when they were forced to work with people from all different countries, the people from similar countries had a similar approach. And when everybody else had different approaches, they thought they were inferior approaches. Then they started getting just used to the fact that they're, they're all trained the same way, but they just approach it differently. Then they started, instead of thinking what's better or worse, they started thinking about, let's look at it from all these different ways. And guess what happened? They became better collectively. One of the things we know about the people who are the most dominant in any area is they usually set what is considered to be normative. So if you think about education, the dominant country, the dominant um, people in our society set what education should be like, what the processes are appropriate, how it should be. And that's been the same now for since we started formal education. So one of the things we're trying to say is that people who would approach something different will struggle because of the way we have designed our education to be basically one way. And even with the modifications people think they're making, we still basically do education with how to approach it one way. And, and I think that's, that creates some problems with culture and education. But poverty is a completely different issue. I've been spending, I've spent the last four years now doing nothing but researching poverty. Um, and there, was, there has been a wonderful upsurge of neuroscience in poverty. Some rock stars, um, Kimberly Noble, um, just rock stars that have done some amazing stuff in, in not only looking at the impact, but looking at towards the solutions. So right now in history, we're at, a, we're at one of those tipping points. We're at the place where poverty is consistently and predictably altering the brains of kids in poverty. Um, the prefrontal cortex is under siege with a drop in gray matter and a drop in white matter. We find that the left hemisphere is decimated, which means language is automatically going to be overwhelmed with the prefrontal cortex being overwhelmed, executive function, self-control, thought. The hippocampus, where learning begins, seems to be highly impacted. So memory is going to be an issue. The whole memory system is attacked. And the amygdala is highly impacted. So the ability to uh, control emotions is under a siege. So now you can almost assume things from kids in poverty. You can assume issues with language, you can assume emotional control issues. You can assume memory issues. So if you have a school that has concentrated poverty, and, and let's, let's not kid ourselves, since we have concentrated poverty to areas, most of the schools that serve those areas are schools with kids from poverty. So you have these schools that have concentrated poverty, have been struggling for years, and our approach to their education is exactly the same thing we have done with all the other models. Because remember, we have a dominant model in our culture, and this is the model that's best, and this is the only model. If I were doing education for kids in poverty, I would scrap some of the things we do. One, if I'm assuming language, and I know enough about language, preschool, elementary, these are critical pieces to start to get a wider range of language in there, have them do more language while singing and moving because there's been a lot of independent research that shows those two components can improve that auditory issues they're having with discrete sounds and actually increase memory function as well as language development faster. I would do more concentrated work with language. I would also do a lot more work with self-control from everything from physical self-control to meditation, I would do a lot of work on memory, from memory games um, to memory contests to memory feats. And I will focus there because all the research says, if I can get your language on, on, on target, on grade level, a lot of other academic areas you can catch up with very quickly. The other problem we have is, is that language makes a shift between the third to sixth grade. 
if you don't correct the issue when the when the language makes the shift in the brain people's brains actually do what is called an adaptation that has it has language performed differently well you know from evolution the way the brain is determined to do language is the most efficient way for our brain if we have an adaptation that we do the language slightly different it doesn't mean you can't get good but the chances of getting to the high level is going to be a lot harder. And if you don't attack it before the brain makes this transition, it becomes a compounded problem. And so we have to start to think about this stuff differently. And if we are not willing to even consider it, because we're, we're sticking to the same curriculum that everybody else has, we're doing the same things that everybody else has, but we're teaching students that are having different issues based on brain structure, but also on environment. The less language in the environment, higher level of stress. There's been studies now that show that by age two, cortisol levels are higher in infants in poverty homes. And that's regardless of if the home is structured and has nurturance. Mm -hmm. Just being in poverty increases cortisol. That's and you know what extended, um, extended periods of cortisol does to the brain and the body. Mm -hmm. So we, we are at a place where if we don't attack this differently, this will be the number one challenge for schools for the next 50 years. And if they don't approach it differently, all the research shows that every generation move in poverty is becoming more severe and it's not going to be a level playing field. And the other sad thing is that when you're saying poverty in the United States, you're having a, a, a high association because the two highest poverty groups is blacks and Hispanics. So basically, we're gonna have the mixture of something called um, a poverty bias. And I, I, I talked about, I'm talking about this in my next book, which is the poverty problem. And one of the things I am saying is that there is a new bias that's occurring. It's called the poverty bias. We, if you think about what we assume about poverty, we assume poor academic performance, um, substance abuse issues, issues of emotional lack of emotional control, poor decision making. I can go on and on. We just assume that about the poor. Well, since we have such a high association of poverty to blacks, we're, we're, we're already seeing that people think about a black student and subconsciously give them the attributes of poverty. And that is problematic because we have created a place where we've associated poverty to a, a group. And we've had that in the United States for so long that you see a black person, regardless of income, we subconsciously give them the attributes of poverty. And that's one of your training topics, right? That I saw online, it was overcoming issues of diversity because we don't know we do this. We do this at a subconscious level, right? So it's almost like we have to, as parents, educators, have a discussion about what we're doing subconsciously, right? This has to be in teacher training, what wasn't in my teacher training 20 years ago. Well, I, I think um, the, the topic of implicit bias people are getting trained out the wazoo on. Harvard did a very good job of making everybody aware of bias, but we're aware of the outcomes of bias. We, this is what bias is producing. This is what bias is causing. But what the training has failed to do is help people understand how bias occurs. And, and that's problematic because if you don't know how it's happening, you cannot recognize it. And you said subconscious is completely accurate. Let's look. Um, when you notice subconsciously a facial expression, it happens between 50 and 200 milliseconds. There are 1,000 milliseconds in one second. If it happens at 2,000 milliseconds, guess what? It's completely subconscious. That means it happened, it influenced you, but you're completely unaware. Let's take something like tone of voice between 50 to 200 milliseconds, we identify emotion. That's the first thing we do when we hear a voice. After that, in the next 200 milliseconds, we identify what is called identifiers. Um, a person's gender, um, race, 
um, health. Um, we even, it's, it's interesting work found that we even can guess with 90% accuracy from tonality, their economic status. <laughs> and so we, we guess a ton of things just from voice tone. So now we've done emotion, who they are, and then the last thing we do is to process words. So all these things have influenced us before we are even aware that we've been influenced. Now, people think when I have a strong opinion of someone, I've, 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 I don't know what's going on. But they don't think that even when they don't, they're making a formulation. And that is what's happening with subconscious bias. And therefore, most people are unaware it's happening. So you don't do anything that you're not aware of. When we did a lot of um, climate research for in large schools, which is years of studies where we're doing it in, in, in all these institutions within the district, and we're doing all the observations and we're studying it. Here's one of the things that shocked folks. From the greatest advocates to the school kids, to people who also shared the same race and culture, all the behaviors that we associated with bias were evident with everyone regardless of race culture. That means the people who thought they were the advocates for the kids had all the trimmings of bias because it was caused subconsciously. Recent research showed that if you actually are taught how the brain recognizes bias and learn all the way it actually occurs, the subconscious can become more conscious and then you start being able to recognize when it occurs. But right now we have been talking about the outcomes of bias and everybody wants to sit down and talk about, yes, you have a bias against black males because they're of aggression. We have a bias towards females. We are aware we have biases. What we don't do well is explain how they occur and how we can retrain our brain to recognize it. Because the minute you know how it occurs, it's like your new car. You know that new car that you thought nobody else has, suddenly you're aware of it and you see it all the time? Yeah. Same thing will happen with the brain. Mm -hmm. The minute you know how it's happening, suddenly you start to see it. You start to see it in other people, but you also start to see it in yourself, mm -hmm. and then you can do self-correction. So training, number one key for overcoming bias, and it's not training of what is implicit bias, it's actually how do we produce implicit bias. Oh, that's not the answer I thought I was going to get. That's deep. Thank you for that. Lots to think about. And I love how you're tying in the how the brain works to this, because th this is the key. This is what I think everyone finds so fascinating about this topic is that we're only discovering these things as we get more and more information about neuroscience. We can learn more about our behavior, which I think is so powerful what you're doing there. From all of your workshops that you've been doing, what obstacles do you see that might hold schools back from making progress with your programs? Like I know you've just touched on some with, with the bias, but um, what are some key areas that schools should focus on so that they do see continual improvements? When we do um, climate assessments um, for years and years and years, um, anybody who's gone through the climate assessments with us will tell you they ask some really strange questions. <laughs> and one of the th reasons we ask so many strange questions is because we are trying to get to something that most people don't care about. We were trying to ascertain beliefs and values. And, and the reason we needed to ascertain beliefs and values is because of the way the brain filters. Um, people are under the delusion that all the information comes to your prefrontal cortex and you make a logical consideration. That's completely bogus. Um, information comes to your brain through your senses. is the only way we get it. Then it goes through your hippocampus, which is a sensory processor. Then it's filtered to the amygdala, which is your emotional brain, by the way, which holds your beliefs and values. And then it goes to your prefrontal cortex. Well, there's been lots of good research that shows this. If I tell you something that goes against your beliefs or values, 
if during while processing the information, if your amygdala has a certain level of reaction, by the time it gets to your prefrontal cortex, it's already been distorted and rejected. So we can't even logically consider it. So what happens with programs? Programs in schools are determined by, does it align well to people's beliefs or values? And if you don't know what the staff's beliefs and values are, then you have no way of aligning which program will work at which school. And we find different programs can work different ways because people's beliefs and values. And oftentimes, if you have a school that's had a very stable staff, amygdala attraction means you oftentimes get a very similar profile to the people doing the hiring. And as a result, you often have very similar profiles and locations if it's been consistent over time. So beliefs and values are highly predictive of how well you do. Um, when we do our programs, one of the things we try to do is approach it through neuroscience this way, and we tell people you can validate this program through your own self. Since if it's based on neuroscience, everything we tell you should be true for you. And that ability to validate for themselves helps it move from this extemporaneous or from this um, personal opinion range and goes towards the science of it. Once we have cognitive agreement, then we have the hard job of retraining behaviors. And what we think is this, our job is to alter or get consistent behavior of the adults of things that we know will benefit the students. And you know what it means to alter a behavior. That means you have to practice it, it has to be successful, then it gets dopamine reinforcement, they have to be able to do it enough so it becomes no longer taxing to their brain, and we have to set it up in a way where they can focus, do it enough, be positive about it, get enough support, and start to get that dopamine secretion of success. And, and I think a lot of the models out there tend to be overwhelming. They try to do too many things too quickly. And so one of the things we try to think about is this, identify beliefs and values, and then win over cognitively, get them to believe, get them to try, make it successful, and then move to the next stage. And it's therefore, it is a slow process, not an instant process. And you know what instant gratification says? It's too much work. So unless you get some people to buy in because they really believe and stick it out because it's gonna take a couple of years. You're not gonna make these kind of changes quickly and that as a result, it's not a great selling point. Somebody else can come in and tell you they can get you turned around in six months. <laughs> buy that. Yeah, right. right. What's, what's interesting is you talk about the buy-in, and I've actually worked with districts that did not have the teacher buy-in, right? It's like the school got a grant, and they were told, here's the program you're using, and it didn't work because it didn't have the teacher buy-in. And so the next year that the program came in, we knew we had to get the buy-in from the teachers. And I see now why, when you talked about the filter of the values and beliefs, of the program we're not with the teachers that we're going to be running it right so that's key to any program that you're going to be doing and so i i get it now i get why your programs are successful because it it does take time to figure out climate survey dig deep um, that's powerful harisha is there anything that you think is really important that we've missed in this topic um I have a concern. Um, oftentimes when there is a clamoring over an issue, people want to jump in there and correct the issue. But if they don't understand enough about the issue, oftentimes their solutions create new complex problems. And one of my fears is that as we are thinking about race and culture, um, in a desire to help and to respond, we're going to rush to respond without actually understanding the issue. And that will be make everybody feel better, but usually it produces unintended consequences that actually create usually some other 
issues of backlash because unless what you do is successful, it's going to create more harm than good. And I'm afraid when it comes to things like culture and bias and race, people are so confused that I don't even think they understand it. And, 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 it's, and it's to the point where people attribute to culture what is actually a product of climate. So, for example, there are people thinking that harsh raising of a child is a product of culture. Harsh raising of a child is a product of environment. People in high stress situations tend to talk less and be more punitive. That has nothing to do with culture. The fact that everybody's been doing it just and justifies it gets people thinking, well, it's part of my culture. So we have people that don't even understand their own culture, much less culture of others. So culture, if you don't even understand culture, how do we even talk about culture? And, 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 and race is a complex issue. And I think we, we, when we start to think about these issues, we need to understand how they occurred, what happened, what got us to where we are today and address it completely differently. Because if we don't start to think about that, you know, I, I trained some folks on how do we get the association of black males to violence? And when they hear it, they're like, oh crap. And then we talked about, okay, what did your, what did your education do to improve it? I showed them in one exercise that their education did zero to improve it. And here's the reason why. I, I get a room of folks and I have them stand up and I name all these black figures from civil, war, civil rights movements and everyone's up and they're all standing. Then I name some other folks. Um, the, the first person who got a Nobel Peace Prize, the richest man who ever lived, the person who came up with the pre-surgery dyslexics, all blacks. Everybody sits down, including the blacks. Everybody sits down. They know nothing of that, but they knew all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Here's something that we that um, some research has proven. If you have been a victim of bad treatment and your education focuses on the bad treatment you have received without giving you education on people who look like you who have achieved great things, it actually increases your anger mm -hmm. and your lack of self-esteem. So guess what our, our wonderful curriculums are designed to do? For, for people who look like me, our curriculums focus on what? Our oppression and our fight to overcome and how badly we were victimized. But it doesn't show me that there's anybody who, who looks like me who accomplished anything. And that's why you end up having a bunch of people say stuff like this. Um, I listened to a black um, female mathematician who was determined that she could be a mathematician because she had the luxury of coming across a black woman who was a famous mathematician. And up to that point, she didn't even know a black person could do math. That seems to be a problem. Our, if we don't accept the fact that our curriculums bias us, and we don't see that our curriculums establish and reinforce the biases we have, and we don't even address the curriculums in that way, how can we endeavor to change things? We haven't looked at the thing that we're supposed to be looking at all the time. We're educators. We're supposed to be looking at what? Curriculum. We never figured out the curriculum biased us. We haven't figured out the curriculum focused us on the wrong things. Um, so, we didn't even fix the stuff that we are professionals in fixing. So now we're going to attack these other issues. You know what's going to happen. We're going to do it quickly, make ourselves feel good, and, and be victims of unintended consequence. Let's start with what we know. How about fixing the curriculum? Because our curriculums in relation to people who are different than the majority do all the same things. Focus on conflicts. If you look, look at the poor Native Americans. Look at what they learn at school. 
does the same thing. Doesn't, doesn't address how I can have hope and expectation for the future, what I can achieve. And I'm not saying you don't need to study those other things. I'm saying they cannot be the only things you study. And I also don't think that you should have in your curriculum a designated time when you talk about people who are different because that for the human brain, when you separate, makes the amygdala actually more irritated. Mm -hmm. So it should be part of the curriculum interwoven, not separate. And, and those are things that I think we need to address and we should be able to address because those are concrete things that we have the power to do as educators. And <laughs> I'm not certain everybody knows how to go about it because they are, they're working from what? The dominant model of the culture that says, this is how we educate, this is what we, it's good to learn, and these are the things that we should all learn regardless of who we are. Off my soapbox. No, it seems when when you're talking about the changes that that need to happen, I think about it when social emotional learning needed to be integrated into the curriculum. And how did they do that? Well, suddenly publishers start figuring out how they're going to change the the core curriculum books and have maybe a growth mindset box into the curriculum so that's what i see needs to happen from the publisher point of view coming from a publishing background like the the textbooks that are going into the classrooms need to address it embedded in the textbook like right. they're doing with social emotional skills now they're embedding it to, in. and i i but think about the bad side of, of when we did that i remember we opened the doors and let them all in but we were so so ill prepared that we we had people's anticipated bad outcome initially happen. We let them in and they struggled. Well, of course you let them in and you struggle because you didn't have everything prepared for them to be successful. And that's what happens when I think we want to do the right thing, but we don't know how to go about it. And so um, I, I think we can be more, we can be successful in doing the right thing. We just need to know what should be the best thing to do. And we need to base it more on, on science. Uh, and I think when we start to think about who we are, here is my take home message. 98.9% .9 of us is exactly the same. All the, all the rest of it accounts for all our variances. And we created a world in which 90% of people choose to focus on what? 1.2% of the variance? I, I choose to focus on the 98.8 because guess what? At a genome level, at a DNA level, guess what we are? The friggin' same. Exactly. Exactly. Horatio, thank you so much for this. You've made me think in ways that I didn't even think I was going to think. And I'm looking at the poster behind you. And does it say Think Change on your wall? Yeah, it says Think Change. Oh, wow. This, it's, it's been a deep and powerful interview. Uh, thank you so much for being so quick to respond to, to do this. And this weekend, it was while just diving into your programs online. If anyone wants to go and learn more about Horatio's programs, you go to resiliencyinc.com. And anyone who wants to follow you, you can follow um, on social media, on Twitter, it's at Resiliency Inc. or on Facebook. And can you just talk a little bit about your programs, how you're doing them these days for schools? Just a quick recap. Well, um. We're doing the, the Zoom stuff, of course, and we offer that. We also try to do a couple neat things and they've had pretty good reviews. Um, we actually have a, filmer, a film director and we have a studio and we actually go and film the training like it's a traditional training. And then the staff can go look at it at the leisure during a period of time. And then there's a set time for Q&A. And this way we, we all can interact 
without the training being just at the same time and that's worked really well and then there are places that are still opening up and and we're going so i'm i'm on the road next week i think and I, I'll still consider going as long as people are going to do the right thing while I'm there and um, we'll do what we can. But um, all the mediums are up there and I, and I think more mediums are, are coming. Uh, and, uh, we're starting to do doing um, some book studies with some groups online in which I'm participating with them. Um, and I, I think we get more creative because of need and crisis. And, the nature of humans is when something like this happens, we will figure out neat new ways to attack it. And I am open. Well, thank you so much for sharing your resources, ideas, books, and coming on the podcast. I appreciate everything you've taught me today. I was happy to see you, happy to spend some time with you. Hope we're now new friends. Absolutely. Have a thank wonderful you. week. You too. Bye-bye.